Birdman and the Galaxy Trio was a short-lived superhero cartoon produced by Hanna-Barbera Productions that originally aired on NBC in 1967. Like many Saturday morning cartoons of the era, it largely served to fill in gaps in programming cheaply, while appealing to children who wouldn't otherwise be in school. And while the studio had produced many successful TV shows, most notably The Flintstones, The Yogi Bear Show, The Jetsons, Johnny Quest, and Scooby-Doo Where Are You, it had a myriad other commercial flops due to their shotgun style of production, where they simply threw a lot at the wall to see what stuck. Eventually, the network started to lose money when Saturday morning cartoons began to fall out of favor during the 1980s, and it was eventually acquired by Taft Broadcasting, which was later acquired by Turner, who used the catalog of properties they gained from this acquisition to launch Cartoon Network. Now in possession of a series of old assets and character rights, Cartoon Network began their foray into original programming, making Space Ghost Coast to Coast, a bizarre amalgamation of old animation cells with modern celebrity interviews that was as esoteric as it was captivating, largely in the sense of, how the hell is this airing on a mainstream television channel? Shortly after this show made a name for itself, a few more stealth premieres were aired in the same general vibe as the first, including Sea Lab 2021, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, The Brack Show, and our subject for this video, Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, or Birdman, is a show that builds off the themes of earlier animation from the 1960s and 70s by picking up these conversations precisely where they left off. Not on television, but the playground, bed of your friend's pickup, and eventually the water cooler, where these icons of our childhood evolved through various iterations as we relived our youth and wondered just what it was we saw in these earlier shows and what kind of things we perhaps didn't pick up on. It targets the original audience of these TV classics decades later and appeals to their changed sensibilities and their barely adapted adulthood. But it did also air on Adult Swim in the early aughts, and as such is a product of its time, containing scenes of violence, racism, sexism, talking dogs, and substance abuse. While I sanitize my language for an easier viewing experience, I still do not stray away from these topics when they appear, and as such, viewer discretion is advised. This retrospective will be split up into individual episode reviews, which themselves are divided into three sections. Recap, Review, and Wrap-Up. Recap is a general detailing of the events of the episode, Review is about the episode's themes by themselves, and Wrap-Up is a connection to the show as a whole, as well as anything I couldn't find another place for. Now, without further ado, let's get that thing I sent ya. Bannon Custody Battle Ray Spannon sues Dr. Benton Quest over the rights to fathership over Johnny and Haji, claiming that he's a better father figure to the boys than their biological father. Harvey Birdman takes the case and interviews the boys, but largely comes to the same conclusions that Race has, with Dr. Quest barely even remembering the names of his own children. Despite a bit of witness coaching, the opposition, Volturo, brings on a series of character witnesses to support the claims that Bannon is the better parent, including a revelation that Bannon even taught the boys to play baseball. This ultimately resolves when Harvey finds a plug from the witness stand to an outlet on the wall, revealing that Race Bannon was merely a robotic construct made by Dr. Zinn, a longtime nemesis of quests, all in an attempt to take custody and capture the boys. This early pilot episode of Birdman shows the general construction of an episode, while failing to introduce many of the aspects that would later be added to the show to support its later memorability. Seven and Seven isn't mentioned at all, and much of the running gag and callback humor is absent, largely due to the extremely limited window of time to call back to. But what this episode does capture is the deeper connection Birdman has to its source material, namely the fact that it references many of the themes that would be present in that sort of show, while adding enough of a modern flair that the audience's suspension of disbelief is betrayed. While back in the 1960s we could have accepted robotic body doubles as a plot point, here, the logistics of such a thing are called into question due to the backdrop of a law firm rather than something more adventurous. The attempt of Dr. Zinn to steal the boys is as elaborate as it is reflective of changing times between the original iteration of Johnny Quest and Harvey Birdman. While a child might buy the idea behind the original show, as an adult you understand that if you're losing your children, it's not going to happen because of a yellow peril stereotype making a nefarious plot, but because of a ruling made in a courtroom. This episode reflects the later series by combining these elements in a dysfunctional way, that somebody trying to update their schemes without fully adapting to the future is doomed to fail twice as much. Very Personal Injury 
After saving the world from a meteor and getting no credit for it, Apache Chief enters a coffee shop where he scalds his lap, rendering him unable to use his powers of growth. He sues the coffee chain as he's now incapable of working, although the suit quickly devolves into a general disillusionment held by the lesser-known heroes, as well as a hefty amount of innuendo about his ability to, well, stay large. When Reducto learns of this during an attempted out-of-court discussion, he schemes to bring in the barista from the coffee shop to testify, which ends up arousing Apache Chief's powers once again, and he's soon able to grow up once more. In the end, despite losing the case, the Chief is satisfied as the case brought him into contact with a group of minorities who form the Multi-Culture Pals, in a hope to get the respect they deserve. This episode draws heavily from a famous case about a woman who sued McDonald's after spilling hot coffee on her lap, something that at the time was derided as a frivolous suit and representative of the entitlement of the average American consumer. Of course, with the retrospect we now know that this was all the carefully crafted result of a multi-billion dollar corporation attempting to deflect blame by running disinformation that made them look better. In reality, the suit was only made to cover the medical bills for the second-degree burn suffered by the victim, something that gets briefly touched upon in this episode as Reducto offers financial recompense to the victim out of court. But it's not about the financial damages caused between Apache Chief losing his ability to work and the initial damages, but the lack of respect leading up to that point that he's truly suing over. Leading roles in older cartoons were near universally white, an attempt to appeal to the largest cartoon-watching demographic to be sure, but one that pushed minorities to the margins where the development of their character also became a secondary aspect of writing. Ultimately, this sort of representation is truly only lip service to actual equality, a way to look at metrics and the on-paper results to say that something is inclusive, when the actual experience between those groups and the fictionalized exploits start to differ to the point of accomplishing almost nothing. Shaggy Busted Shaggy and Scooby are pulled over while driving the mystery machine erratically under suspicion of being under the influence. They're arrested when Shaggy speeds off during the traffic stop, and the rest of the groovy gang hire Birdman to represent them around the same time the titular attorney is searching for a new clerk, which he finds in the extremely laid-back Peanut. Despite his initial impressions of the boys as gang members, he soon learns from his friends that Shaggy and Scooby were never under the influence of anything, and that they're just like that all the time. But the court doesn't see it the same way when the opposition, the foppish Spyro, shows out of context still frames and clips from the old Scooby-Doo cartoon that implicates them further. Eventually, Fred and Velma get the idea to simply track down the monster of the week in order to prove that Shaggy's initial claims of a green monster were true and not innuendo. One of the classic schoolyard rumors of the adolescence of anybody growing up exposed to Scooby-Doo was the blatant pro-drug paraphernalia of the early run of the show, the type of thing that would later on inspire dozens of sketches in Robot Chicken and adjacent media. And it's clear that this episode is built upon these conversations much more than the actual show. To a person growing up on Scooby-Doo, and living under a rock otherwise, this episode is much less meaningful than a person who grew up not only on the culture of Saturday morning cartoon programming, but on the culture that surrounded the viewers. Because conventions and forums and lunch table discussion was always just as much a part of the experience as the media itself. In this episode, we have the hypocrisy of a system run largely by the generation that grew up in the era of free love and pretending you were at Woodstock, then turning 30 and turning around to demonize popular music as having satanic messages hidden inside and believing that all drug users were murderers waiting on a spree. Shaggy and Scooby are profiled by the justice system in the same way they were profiled by those who grew up on the show, given a stereotype based on their behavior that added a level of depth to the show that was never intended to be there in the first place. Death by Chocolate The cave of Yogi and Boo Boo is raided by the ATF, and Phil Kin Seven gives the task of defending the Bear's Fourth Amendment rights to Harvey. During the case, it's debated whether the bear is the Unabubu, a terrorist sending package bombs to various corporate officials in the same vein as the Unabomber, but this is ultimately disproved by Harvey making the connection that the letters were written on an electric typewriter with the misaligned T, while the cave doesn't have electricity. But later, when Harvey and Boo Boo are celebrating the victory, he finds a typewriter hooked up to a generator, and after misaligning the T himself, starts to fear for his life as he got a murderer off free. In the end, Boo Boo gives him a cookie bouquet, the same method of killing the Yuna Boo Boo had used, and Harvey zaps him with an energy beam before the whole cast laughs it off. 
This episode borrows much of its plot from the neo-noir film Jagged Edge, down to plot beats and scene framing. Likewise, the episode takes many of the darker aspects of the film noir revival of the 80s, which it then combines with real cases of a serial killer in order to create an amalgamation of pop culture that ideally becomes greater than the sum of its parts. And all of this to say nothing of the fact that every character is a reused asset from old Hanna-Barbera properties. That said, the episode then suffers a bit for anybody unfamiliar with any of the three cultural references made at the intersection of this story, relying far too heavily on the fact that it is a reference for some of the jokes to land in a vacuum. On top of all of that, it's too busy juggling three different character beats to really say anything about them on their own. But far from this being damning evidence of the show losing its edge, it then plays into some of the more bombastic writing that characterized the later, greater episodes. Plots and running gags overlapping so thoroughly that punchlines begin to coincide in an episode with a runtime of 11 minutes, with 22 minutes worth of jokes that feels like it only lasted 5. Show You Weenie While preparing to take their number one Japanese hit worldwide, the band Show You Weenie discovers that an American band, the Neptunes, has plagiarized their song in the West. They hire Harvey to manage the case, who then uses Peanut as a translator. With Reducto on opposing counsel and Min Talk the Mind Taker presiding, all three men on that side of the bar find themselves too enthralled with the testifying musicologist to create a decent argument for either side. But when Peanut produces a side-by-side -side of the karaoke tracks, the judge approves the plagiarism claim, only for the band to find that their song has been stolen once again by a German group. The fetishization of Japanese culture by the West is an interesting phenomenon, something that every avid anime fan can attest to, at least in part. Between an idea that Japanese women are more demure than their Western counterparts, or that the culture has more merit to it than the West, there's a pervasive idea that the cherry-picked parts of an ideal society are better than the full picture of the culture in which the claimant has grown up in. Ironically enough, many incels within the Japanese community also mention similar gripes, that Western women are more appealing due to not acting like children, so it's a strong case in which the grass appears greener on the other side of the Pacific. The reality is that Japanese culture is one obsessed with work, often for no sake other than to work, but since the optics of the country rarely try to draw attention to this fact, we get an image overseas that purely focuses on the moe aesthetics and end result, rather than the Kuroshi that created that culture. This gets reflected in the episode itself, as Harvey's response to a Japanese child mentioning she hasn't eaten in weeks is showing her an American football, enthralled by the fact that he doesn't know enough Japanese to follow along with what's really going on. The Dabba Dawn Mafia Don Fred Flintstone asks for Seven and Seven's help with setting up a few legitimate businesses. But when he's arrested, the case then turns to a complex web of cover-ups, bribery, executions, and more Mafia movie references than it makes sense to include, all culminating in Harvey trying to get Fred out of jail on an insanity plea. That Fred turns into an alternate persona whenever he's hit in the head, something that happens frequently. In the end, Fred gets let off only for the real boss behind everything to be revealed as Barney. Between the myriad Mafia media parodied in this episode, most frequently Godfather and The Sopranos, and all the other ongoing plots, this episode turns into less of an outright parody and more of a pop-cultural pastiche of the mob genre in general. It touches on the fascination people have had and still have with the world of organized crime, less so from the mundane murders and mayhem, and more so the aesthetic of guys in suits with cigars inviting each other to their daughter's weddings. Basically, mafia movies based on the interpretation of a person who pulled out their phone during The Godfather. But Harvey Birdman, the show, embraces this absurdity rather than suffering for it. The show crams so much into a single scene that Harvey Birdman, the guy, even fails to follow along with it at many points, the episode climaxing with an absurdist clown performance over old Flintstones clips, akin to a bad AMV minus the Lincoln Park. And so much in the same way that children once idolized the rule of law as enforced by superheroes, they became adults and began to have an idolization on those from the other side, with the same disdain for due process and reality as always. In the end, while the optics of our taste evolve, the core of why we find these things appealing remains the exact same. Dead o Mutt, Part 1 Seven and Seven adds a new ampersand to the company logo, a portent that a new partner to the firm will be announced. Birdman assumes it will be him, though Peanut doesn't have as much faith. 
In the end, it's revealed the new partner is also the newest hire, Azul Falcone, a bon vivant European stereotype who, who quickly wins over the hearts of the rest of the firm. As Azul's reputation becomes more pronounced, Harvey is left behind, ultimately being demoted to having an office in the men's room. But when Harvey is made to lighten some of Azul's caseload, he learns that Falcone is a fraud, and that his assistant, Dynomutt, does all the real work. Wishing to get his position back, Harvey decides that he needs to kill the mutt, but when copying his resume later, the remains to the dog are found strewn inside the copier, and Birdman is arrested. Dead Mutt was originally envisioned as the final episode of Season 1, the show ending on a cliffhanger in an attempt to increase a demand for a renewal. But this plan backfired as executives didn't like the inconclusive ending, and more episodes were created for the first season's run in order to give a proper ending. But Birdman was renewed for a second season, with the show continuing on to begin building upon itself. This is typically done through a series of escalating running gags, but beyond that, the show is also the first of Adult Swim's original programming to take a strong approach to continuity, rather than each episode resetting from the start, even if a few of the more absurd endings have to be necessary in order to facilitate the sort of episode-to-episode -episode story building. But the commitment to continuity ends up working out, whereas the earlier properties tended to stray away from anything but episodic standalone stories, Birdman's continuity adds an extra layer of stake to the plots giving a more relatable standard that winds up making the courtroom antics feel as though the stakes are heavier than the existential threats that old superheroes used to fight. Dead Mutt Part 2 Harvey spends his time in prison as he awaits a trial, being represented by Falcone, who doesn't bother to do a very good job of defending his client as, as he believes Harvey is guilty himself. The case goes on, with Spyro presenting more and more damning evidence against Birdman, who claims he's innocent, as Dynomutt was simply clumsy enough to have gotten caught in the copier on his own. And the jury eventually finds Harvey not guilty, though Mintog doesn't like having his predictions go wrong and sentences Harvey to death row anyway. He spends the next five years in jail, where he learns to read again, forgets he can fly, and eventually awaits his execution only to then learn that the entire ordeal was, from the beginning, a 40th birthday prank arranged by Falcone, with none of the charges being real, except the wedding to Magilla Gorilla. Dead Omut resolves in the most anticlimactic way it possibly can outside of the story being just a dream, but the episode leans into the negative continuity of its origins by stretching the believability of its plot to the point of breaking, and then pulling it a bit further beyond. Between Birdman forgetting how to fly, forgetting how to read, and so many moments of shoddy courtroom tactics, the show has to bend over backwards to make an episode with any sort of payoff, and then despite doing all of this, still decides at the last minute not to pay off anything anyway. It harkens back to the original cartoon's lack of connecting threads to one another, or forced status quo endings, by intentionally removing the stakes from anything that occurs. In the end, we're not meant to take the plots especially seriously, instead focusing on what the episode is trying to say beyond the synopsis, and in doing so is able to strip away a lot of the unnecessary fluff that normally would have gotten in the way of a properly memorable story. We don't remember the drama and the court cases of Harvey Birdman, we remember the gags, references, and we allow the show to reshape the way we engage with the original material. It's able to make its mark on culture by explicitly avoiding any similarities that make sense, only including the absurd elements to draw attention away from them. Plot points so absurd, you'd be missing the point if you look too deeply at them. X The Exterminator The episode begins with a flashback to 26 years ago, as X, the Eliminator, is hired by Fear to steal the crest on Birdman's helmet. He fails in his attempts and the episode cuts to the present, where the now unemployed Exterminator sees his nemesis on a commercial and begins plotting to steal the crest once again. But Harvey doesn't recognize the guy at all and winds up agreeing to get coffee with him later, something he also blows off as he begins to suffer from a bout of constipation while also dealing with a slew of lawsuits against Philkin Sebin for running over multiple people. X continuously tries to zap Harvey with an oversized console while Harvey struggles to manage the case alongside his toilet issues. But when X finally succeeds, Avenger steps in to fight him off and reverse the effects of the ray, giving Harvey the much-needed energy to fight the case and his constipation in short order. Much of the cast of Harvey Birdman consists of people who have set aside the life of a Saturday morning cartoon lead in order to live a more down-to-earth, realistic style. 
just in the same way that those who grew up hoping to be fantastic things eventually created, or settled for, more realistic dreams and goals. Harvey is no longer a crime fighter, he's an attorney, but X never had this moment of realization and has remained obsessed over a comical premise for the last two and a half decades of his life. While the world moved on from childhood, he did not. And so we see a character who suffers delusions of how the real world works, as it largely ignores his attempts at reliving those lost glory days in the pursuit of something that was never real. But despite all this, or perhaps because, X is one of the few genuine characters to exist within the show's cast. He's chasing an impossible dream, but he's at least pursuing something. Harvey may have ambitions, as we saw in the previous episode, but here he's defending a man who ran over multiple people and feels no remorse. While Harvey was once a hero, he's now a force that reinforces the harm that others do. The real world turned him into one of its own. A villain. So this episode leaves us with a dichotomy between the man-children who continue to dream of a better world, and the adults who have long since accepted that changing things for the better is impossible. SPF After finding a mole on his face, Harvey starts to fear the sunlight's effect on his skin. But as he gains his powers from the sun, he starts to feel slow and sluggish. So he turns to Peanut to obtain some tanning cream, tanning cream, that can revitalize him. He then takes a copyright case from Dingling Wolf, who recently learned that his name has been registered online for the URL of a smut site. But Harvey is struggling to represent his client well, as he keeps crashing from the effects of withdrawal, selling more and more to Peanut to get his next fix, until eventually the rest of Seven and Seven holds an intervention, despite their hypocrisy, about his addiction. In the end, Harvey manages to go clean as he learns that the mole that started the whole plot was merely a speck of gravy. The episode also concludes with a tongue-in-cheek PSA about skin cancer, or something like that. With the start of Season 2 came a number of changes to the show's formula, most noticeably the shift from digital to flash animation, a set of tools much better suited to the rapid cuts and repeatable gags of the show, something that had caused headaches during production as reshoots and retakes became more and more time-consuming. This comes with a sense of irony as the show recycled so many assets from the Hanna-Barbera library that themselves were designed to be reused repeatedly to cut back on production costs. The show's creation has nearly come full circle, as it was now animated in-house and much more cheaply than before. But season 2 also included a shift in the structure of episodes, almost immediately foregoing any sort of legal conclusions in favor of making the show into more of an office comedy. This episode starts with Harvey complaining about parking spaces, and ends without even wrapping up the case that started before the opening credits. The legal approach fades more and more into the background, as the show starts to embrace not the initial premise, but what it would later evolve into. Trio's Company Inch High P.I. gets fired from his detective agency job for being too short to produce decent quality photos and he sues for discrimination. Meanwhile, Harvey joins a gym after hearing himself fat guy grunt, and there he meets Gigi, Gravity Girl, a woman who seems to get around with everybody except Harvey himself. But he tries asking her out and she immediately moves in with him, only to continue abstaining from any sort of physical relationship, again, just with Harvey. Inch High P.I. eventually settles out of court, and then takes on the job of learning how Gigi really feels, unveiling the footage in court later, despite the case being settled. It's revealed that Gigi really does have feelings for… somebody. Mintok declares a verdict of not guilty, targeted towards nobody again, and there's a seven-way marriage. Continuing in the theme of episodes that completely ignore the courtroom aspect of the show, Trio's company doesn't even bother trying to make the court have a reason to be there. The case is settled out of court, and then everybody gets brought back anyway because that's just how episodes end. It's an ironic fixation on sticking to a formula that allows the showrunners to reuse assets and background while keeping the show easy to follow for younger audience members. Now a totally pointless endeavor, as the target audience is 20 years older and they have no issues with producing new assets. This is coupled with the show's new introductions of continuity, things that begin to build on themselves as plots start to reference past events more and more frequently something that fundamentally does not work with the style of show that's being parodied and played up in this show. It intentionally draws attention to why so many old shows rejected continuity in favor of standalone episodes. It wasn't merely a creative decision done to keep costs down, but something that was actually enforced by the very structures of these older shows in writing. The Devlin Made Me Do It 
When a child injures himself trying to imitate Ernie Devlin's ravine jump, he sues for damages. Devlin hires Harvey to prove that he's not liable for the actions of anybody trying to imitate his stunts, and uses explanations of the TV rating system and safety lessons in instructional videos to defend himself. But despite Harvey's attempts to prove that the child is faking, the case ends up going poorly, until he notices Ernie's addictions. After a discussion on his history of pill popping, Harvey changes his defense to one of an insanity plea. Ernie was driven to desperation by his addiction and cannot be held liable. But as insanity pleas are only used in criminal cases, Devlin winds up losing the case. In a B-plot, Avenger is discovered laying on top of an egg, so Harvey begins nurturing it while trying to uncover the bird's sex, only to later discover that the egg was simply Peter Potamus's lunch that he stashed in Harvey's office. Many of the shows of the 60s and 70s had poor lessons to take from its stories, whether these came in the form of inimitable acts by its characters, or social lessons taken away that reinforce stereotypes or misrepresent cultures. A lot of the impact of these shows are things still felt today, as people's perception of the world outside their sphere of suburbia was shaped by how it was presented on television. Bobby wants to imitate Devlin as he believes that the stuntman was cool. None of the negative effects of such a dangerous lifestyle were ever portrayed, and as a result, were unknown to the audience. But Harvey raises a point about self-regulation here. How much of the responsibility lies on the viewers for not being able to recognize that what they see on TV is fictional, or at the very least, misrepresentative of the real world. If a child sees something dangerous on television and tries to imitate it, how at fault can we really put the people who put it there if they know full well it's a bad idea? So in the end, it's not the acts of characters on television that we hold accountable, but the way these acts are portrayed by the narrative itself. High Speed Buggy Chase Speed Buggy, a sentient car, leads the police on a high-speed chase across the city and hires Harvey to represent him. But Harvey is busy struggling with Avengers quitting, the Hawk leaving to work for Volturo instead. While in Discovery, Harvey tests out a series of new avian assistants, eventually settling on a parrot with a good knowledge of case law. But when Volturo gets fired, Harvey is no longer searching for anybody to fill the position, until the parrot also quits to work for Volturo. In the end, Harvey discovers that Mark and Debbie, two of Speed Buggy's friends, have been making out on top of his remote control, the racing devil entendre is causing his erratic behavior. In the end, he's let off the hook and Avenger gets rehired by Harvey with additional benefits. Harvey leads his legal team, taking a majority of the credit for winning cases and having his name in the title of the show. Peanut is largely disinterested in following legal cases, using the connections at the law firm for his own purposes, as he does in this episode, chumming around with George Washington for most of the runtime. But Avenger is often forgotten about in the midst of everything else going on, though he's not the only character treated this way. Harvey himself is considered a second-class employee at 7 and 7, Phil Kin 7 nearly firing him in every episode, and constantly overlooking his actual accomplishments throughout. There's a sense of injustice in the way that Harvey is treated by his boss, and this sense is then passed on to Avenger, creating a sort of justice to the entire hierarchy. But despite this sort of karmic appropriation, it's not as though anything is truly solved. Harvey may have mistreated Avenger, but it's not as though Harvey being in turn neglected by Phil makes life any better for the dictating Hawk. He begins to work for the illegible Vulturo, where he's equally passed over for professional success, showing that the grass isn't truly greener on either side unless you water it. It takes Harvey realizing how much worse of a lawyer he is without his assistant before he finally gives Avenger what he deserves. Two wrongs don't make a right, and sometimes the answer to a misdeed is just to let it slide. Back to the present. When the skybound futuristic homes of the Jetsons are flooded, the family travels back in time to sue the past for ruining the planet. But their appearance in the year 2004 causes paranoia in Phil, who believes that they are aliens coming to probe him. While Mintok starts to grow resentful of the boy genius Elroy, who's able to look back at events that are about to happen, making his mind-taking future predicting powers worthless. While defending their case, Harvey starts to wonder about the effect the Jetsons traveling back in time will have on the future, as well as whether the actions of those living in the present really are damaging the planet in the long run. But Reducto assures him there's nothing to worry about, and that one person's actions can't do much to prevent it anyway. In the end, the futuristic jury vac brought in to make the ruling determines the wrong case, and the charges are dropped, only for Harvey's office to flood from rising water levels. 
Issues like global warming have always been trying to fight for attention against bad faith arguments along the lines of, it's not happening, and if it is, it's not caused by humans, and if it is, then it's nothing we can do about it, and if there is, then it's too great a cost, and if it isn't, then it's already too late. The kind of person who would look at a record-setting blizzard and record-setting drought in the same year as proof that the other one is nothing to worry about. Many people view climate change as the kind of thing that happens to other people, whether they're living in the third world or the future, and that our current infrastructure will surely insulate us from the worst of it. But just as the Jetson family is far off in the distant future of 2002, the problems aren't limited to merely existing in the present, nor are the solutions. Because the relaxed, carefree lifestyle the future espouses is just as indicative of their view on the issues as ours is. The future, just like the present, doesn't care about the consequences of their actions until they start to feel them. There's no push to limit technological usage or advancement to what they know is sustainable until after their homes start to flood, just as people in the present don't care about climate change until theirs do too. Black Watch Plaid Phil begins to notice that furniture is missing from his office, which didn't have furniture in it in the first place, and starts setting up security cameras all over, which continuously ramps up until his privacy violations reach a point that everything is being watched. He notices that Harvey isn't doing enough work, and demands the attorney get a case by the end of the day, so he represents Secret Squirrel, a spy who keeps various tools in his trench coat, but gets accused of flashing every time he reaches for one. Harvey tries to use an argument that the squirrel is only protecting his country when he opens his coat, but Phil shows footage gathered of the squirrel actually flashing somebody to ruin the defense. In the end, the employees of 7 and 7 conspire to get the cameras removed by blackmailing Phil with footage they've captured of him. This episode is made up almost entirely of recycled footage, with only a few scenes being original content. Most notably among these are the various live-action shots. These live-action scenes were much easier to create relative to the cost of animation, and were used throughout the show as a cost-cutting measure, as well as a gag. What's also interesting is that William Street gained access to a series of costumes of various Hanna-Barbera properties, even the obscure ones, when they gained the rights to use the characters. So the live-action segments are also a means of taking advantage of this bizarre situation. The plot of the episode itself takes heavy inspiration from things like the Patriot Act, draconian measures that violated the privacy of citizens as an overblown response to terror attacks. Through this episode, we see Phil abuse his power by overreacting to every little thing that happens, punishing his employees more and more thoroughly for, for the theft of his furniture and allowing his paranoia to create a bigger issue than what it was trying to solve. It isn't until these privacy violations start to affect him that he realizes this, though, as power often insulates those who have it from their own actions. Grape Juiced While performing at the Laugh Olympics, Grape Ape drops several containers of marked steroids and has his medals revoked. Harvey takes the case, although he's too busy with Gigi's announced pregnancy. She's claimed he's the father, and is confused as the two have only been group married for a few weeks. Meanwhile, Phil is trying to buy off the Olympic planning committee to have the games performed locally, and gives one of the members' his son a position as Harvey's new paralegal. During the case, a doctor called to the stand is about to read the test results from Grape Abe's urine sample, but gets dart gunned by Harvey's new paralegal before he can read the results. In the end, the jury finds Grape Ape guilty and he's ordered to perform a song to high schoolers about drug abuse. When the doctor wakes up, he reveals that Gigi's unborn child was actually fathered by Grape Ape. The use of performance-enhancing drugs has always been a point of contention in any competitive environment. Many things that objectively enhance your performance are fine, with many of these having a secondary medical use as well. The line between what constitutes a legal supplement and an illegal one are arbitrary at best and exclusionary at worst. Could caffeine be considered performance enhancing? How about Ritalin? Since many professional athletes are already pushing their bodies to the point of permanent damage, why not open the floodgates and see just how fast a human being really can run? Of course, this then comes down to the fact that many pro athletes are also icons of advertisement, and people that many children look up to. If a beloved public figure is taking a harmful supplement for the purpose of competition, then it follows that many who look up to them will imitate that behavior. So part of the idea behind banning these substances isn't for the sanctity of the games or health of those competing, but in protecting those watching at home from getting an idea about what they need to do for fame and recognition. P. 
Peanut Puberty Peanut starts to develop his superpowers during a company meeting and can't control the size of his shield, much to his humiliation. Harvey tries to explain to the boy what's going on, but fails to do so in a proper manner, turning to other heroes for advice on what to tell his ward. Eventually, he begins searching for a villain to give him his first experience of vanquishing a bad guy, settling on X the Eliminator to do the deed. But X demands the crest on Birdman's helmet as payment, which he begrudgingly obliges, until a pep talk from Black Vulcan gets him the motivation to find a villain on his own. Meanwhile, Augie Doggy comes to Birdman for help, as his father has been labeled as aggressive and is set to be put down. Mintok orders obedience training and Phil takes charge of the situation, breaking Doggy Daddy into becoming an animal. Gaining superpowers as a metaphor for going through puberty works on multiple levels in this episode, in large part due to the prevalence of other media works that take on similar themes. Practically any teenage superhero in fiction will, at some point, have the comparison drawn between the new world of fighting crime or whatnot and their personal coming of age. It's practically a staple of any young adult fiction, and something that was leaned into heavily throughout history. Just as many fictional stories sell a romanticized version of events, they also tend to make adulthood come across as something much less awkward than it truly is, especially to those who have already gone through it and are aware of what sort of weirdness will ensue. It merely takes an earnest discussion about what to expect to get Peanut to come out of his fearful state and into a more confident and comfortable one. This clarity coming from Black Vulcan, who tells him that everything is unexpected and therefore nothing is. With so many supers struggling to come up with the right path into adulthood, they forget that there is no right path, as there's no path at all. You grow up whether you intend to or not. Gone Efficient Phil hires Duvud an efficiency expert, in order to improve efficiency and reduce cost at 7 and 7 by timing everything and reducing all employee expenses. Among the money-saving measures are Harvey's office being shared with a Greek restaurant and all the office supplies being locked behind paywalls. While trying to juggle the new expectations, Harvey gets a client in Yaki Doodle, who wants a name change. But the previous case runs long and Harvey begins falling behind on other obligations. In the end, the court gets confused and orders a mandatory chemical castration for Yaki, which also happens to be his new name. Harvey is also finally able to get rid of the efficiency expert by getting him drunk. There's a desire in any industry for optimization and efficiency to cut costs while retaining as much quality as it makes sense to have. But when it comes down to a decision between a good, lasting show and a cheap one, most executives will choose the latter. Better to make some short-term profit than to risk giving a raise to the writers for having a long-running show. The understanding behind this logic comes down to basic economics under capitalism. A good product will be made so long as there's a financial incentive for one. The desire to make money will eventually produce good television, but when you focus entirely on the effect over the cause, you start to drive down quality and goodwill in favor of short-term gains. This is the exact thing that led to the 1980s Dark Age for animation, as more and more cheap cash grabs oversaturated the market and society collectively lost interest. Hanna-Barbera created so many iconic shows for a generation, and then went under as they started to view these shows as a means to an end, instead of as the reason for the studio's existence. It isn't to say that everybody out there making cartoons is only doing so for the money, though. Many talented and passionate people wind up getting crushed in the crossfire between markets and executives, just as Harvey in this episode gets overworked by the detached Phil and Duvud. So an episode like this explores the frustration any creative type working for a studio must feel when they're told to do more with less by people who are just in it for the bottom line, with no understanding of the decades of passion that got them to that point. Droopy Botox Droopy Dog sues a plastic surgeon for a botched Botox injection, but Harvey is able to get the surgeon free of liability. So we shower 7 and 7 with money as well as coupons for various plastic surgeries. With their newfound wealth, Harvey is promoted to vice president of 7 and 7, with a huge new raise and new office to go with it. But Harvey feels empty inside after constantly remembering the sad, sort of, face Droopy made when his life was ruined by his lawyering and tries to come up with a way to make things right, eventually giving away much of his money to the dog. Meanwhile, X is selected to be the interior decorator and puts up various death traps throughout Harvey's office, eventually billing him $1 million or the crest from Harvey's helmet. 
With no money left to pay the Eliminator, he instead gives him a bunch of plastic surgery coupons, which X views as a roundabout way of saying he's unattractive. In the end, everybody gets plastic surgery to the point of being unrecognizable, and Harvey realizes that nobody really learned anything from the experience as long as they wound up rich. Inherent to the profession of a lawyer is a lack of morals in terms of which cases you take and turn down. A lawyer is supposed to be a zealous advocate for their case, and if they can't make a good faith argument in favor of their client, are ineligible to take the job. As such, you lose out on a lot of clientele and future recommendations if you have a strong sense of morality in the profession, something that happens to Harvey in this episode. He regrets getting everything he's ever wanted out of life due to the heavy moral cost of receiving it. Remember, he started out as a superhero, a profession of helping the downtrodden who can't defend themselves. And yet this episode ultimately concludes without some strong moral on the righteousness of justice. Droopy never receives proper recompense for what happened to him, he just got a bunch of money. This endowment even went far enough as to change his outlook, the facial paralysis now being a smiling attitude. The rest of the employees at 7 and 7 and Birdman ultimately don't care about the harm they could be doing, simply going along with the questionable morality of it all, because that's what everyone else is doing too. Guitar Control Quick Draw McGraw is arrested for illegally possessing a concealed six-string guitar when he pulls it out while trying to arrest the Dalton gang. Harvey represents his case, while receiving a large amount of support from the guitar lobby, which has also funded a campaign for Phil Ken Seven to run for president by giving him $12 billion. Harvey argues that it's a constitutional right to bear guitars, and that arresting Quickdraw was a violation of his most basic right as an American, while Reducto uses the argument that the Founding Fathers would not have intended for people to carry around electric guitars, and could not have predicted the modern music industry. But none of that matters, as Mintalk is replaced by his judge by Mitor, who's been bribed by the lobbyists, and the case gets thrown out. In the end, Phil doesn't win the election due to who he generally is as a person, and Peanut accidentally kills Baba Louie with the six string. Harvey uses an argument in this episode about the intentions of the Founding Fathers, that the right to bear arms, like guitars, is guaranteed by the Constitution despite the fact that the Constitution was designed from the outset to be amended routinely as society changed. And Quick Draw McGraw uses the argument that dictators often restrict access to firearms when getting into power, ignoring that these are often symptoms of the rhetoric that these types use to argue their way into power in the first place, often claiming an imminent collapse of society so terrified people will vote them into power in the first way. Although it's not as though either of these arguments were relevant in the first place. The whole case during this episode is shown to be more or less a marketing stunt by the guitar lobby in order to consolidate power by creating a fake culture war over the concept of guitar control. Nothing sells guitars faster than telling everybody they're about to be banned, and this is backed up by sales figures spiking during years where pro-guitar control politicians win elections. It ultimately comes down to an attempt to turn regular customers into fanatics, not just selling them one guitar and leaving it at that, but convincing them that it's a core part of their identity to own several in spite of what common sense might say. Most culture war discourse is really just an ad campaign by whoever is selling the product under attack. Booty Noir Interspersed with a tongue-in-cheek pastiche of film noir erotic anthologies, this episode sees Harvey both defending and apprehending Wally Gator, who has refused to join with the polite society encroaching his land and lifestyle. Meanwhile, Reducto overhears an argument between Black Vulcan and his now ex-girlfriend Norlissa, although he's only really concerned with Norlissa's rear. He prepares to shrink it, but finds himself too enthralled by the shape to do anything, and ends up having a crisis of humanity as he has found something he cannot shrink. In the end, he sleeps with Norlissa, but gets caught by Black Vulcan, who, rather than being mad, gets back together and turns the relationship into a polygamous one. Back in the other plot, Wally Gator is found guilty and sentenced to mud wrestle Abraham Lincoln. The second season of Birdman saw a series of changes that steadily moved the show away from its roots as a legal procedural drama involving old Hanna-Barbera properties and towards new, more absurd territory. It was never too much of a stretch for something completely out of nowhere to occur that either completely changes the plot or goes unnoticed, but by the start of season 3 the steady shift has pushed the show into bizarre territories that nearly come across as a piece of performance art rather than standard television. 
This absurdity was reflected in and reflected from the rest of Adult Swim programming at the time, steadily becoming less about telling a story and more about pushing boundaries of what can be shown on television, less so as a matter of decency and more so a matter of taste. But the goodwill brought on by the first few years meant that keen and consistent viewers would remain enamored by the content as they knew it wasn't the procedurally generated ramblings of a bunch of vanities in a tank, but rather could contain flashes of intentional brilliance. The showrunners have proven that they can create a compelling piece of fiction. It's a question of whether or not they choose to use that ability moving forward. Harvey's Civvy Harvey gets sued by a villain he vanquished decades ago, Murrow the Marauder, which begins evolving into a class action lawsuit by the multiple menaces he's defeated through his career. He has Peter Potamus defending his case, though the hippo is too distracted by the stenographer to make a compelling argument. Meanwhile, the defense, led by Shadow the Brain Thief, is feuding with Mintok the Mind Taker over their similar abilities, but after the first day of the case, the two head out for drinks where they begin to form a bond over this. Harvey begins to worry, not only over his chances to win the case, but as to whether or not he really did hurt all those people over the years. But the case concludes when Mintok reveals a piece of discovery that Shadow didn't respond to properly, throwing the case out as a mistrial. Harvey has another crisis of identity in this episode, that despite the optics of being a superhero, he's not really that much of a good guy. Many of the villains he's faced throughout the years have been mangled and injured beyond the ability to function normally as a result of his actions, and now that he's in a position within society with a much closer relationship to due process, he understands that maybe violence as a first resort was not the catch-all solution that he thought it was. Many superheroes in earlier works would never consider any sort of ideological reconciliation with their antagonists, assuming everybody just wanted a fight. But to be fair, this was more often than not absolutely true. Villains weren't written to be interesting deconstructions of some sociological oppression, they were rarely fighting against some wrong inflicted upon them, nor did their nefarious schemes have any positive purpose. They were bad guys. Their job was to be a bad guy. Not enough thought was put into motive by the writers as the target audience was equally unlikely to put any thought into motive. But as time went on, there began a trend in media that every villain must be sympathetic and redeemable. They have to be the good guys from their own perspective. Forget the narrative value of a more existential threat, older audiences wanted a villain who made sense instead of spectacle. In this episode, these labels are applied retroactively, to everyone's mutual confusion. X gets the crest. Harvey bets and loses his crest in a game of poker against X. But as X was originally commissioned by Fear to get the crest and they no longer exist, he stirs on what to do with it in the meantime, ultimately deciding to put it on himself. The crest then starts to take over his actions, compelling him to stop villainous deeds throughout the world, which gets him fame, but not fulfillment. Meanwhile, Harvey is representing Ricochet Rabbit, who is being held liable for destroying the town of Hoop and Holler while trying to apprehend criminals. He loses the case, and Ricochet is ordered to take medication for his ADD and ADHD. But after a breakdown, Harvey eventually pulls himself up and appeals the case by demanding that Mintok take the meds to experience the effects themselves. With newfound confidence, he calls the crestfallen, pun intended, X to brag about a better crest, tricking him into trading it for a worthless sticker and getting his own life back. X has only ever had one purpose in life, to steal the crest on Birdman's helmet. Once he achieves this, he loses that purpose despite fulfilling his dream, and loses any motivation to keep living. Despite having television appearances and the accomplishments he wants, he never had a long-term goal to work for, and was doomed from the same stagnation that caused him so much strife in the first place. If your goals are all singular and tangible, then you're doomed to be directionless due to those goals either being too rigid to achieve or pointless once accomplished. And Harvey gets overly hung up on his crest as well. He starts to mimic the behaviors of his unknown rival following his loss, the downfall of his psyche being blamed for things like losing a case, despite the fact that he's lost plenty of cases before without it really bothering him. In the end, he learns that this confidence didn't come from the crest even if his powers did, and so it was pointless to lose confidence for losing the crest in the first place. Bird Girl of Guantanamo It's Take Phil's Daughter to Work Day, and Phil introduces Harvey to his daughter, Judy. 
But Judy is secretly a fan of Harvey's, disguising herself as Bird Girl and trying to become his sidekick, despite his insistence that he doesn't need one. They take the case of Morocco Mole, who has been detained in Git Mole for two years with no charges or trial. But Harvey can't focus on the case or any of his other responsibilities while Bird Girl is around, and after she nearly kills Ernie Devlin during a will writing, he kicks her out until she gets a law degree, which she does from a three-hour course. While this is going on, Phil starts to become attracted to Bird Girl, not realizing she's his daughter in disguise, and tasks her with finding Judy, not realizing they're the same person. In the end, Bird Girl is able to solve the case by finding evidence that Morocco Mole was, in fact, a mole working for the US government. Now with a better appreciation for her litigation skills, Harvey accepts Bird Girl as his new sidekick. Bird Girl's enthusiasm for a sidekick position is something that, at the time, was viewed as immature and unaware. That somebody should have such a passion for a position at an attorney's office must be a sign that they're not all there. And Bird Girl is routinely shown to be out of touch with reality. But then again, at 7 and 7, who isn't? The entire show's appeal comes from recycling of older properties and the audience's recognition of the faces they grew up with. So for this sort of appeal to occur means that there's a non-zero number of people out there who resent the fact that they ever really had to grow up in the first place. As such, Bird Girl is actually a much better stand-in for the average viewer than any other character. The rest of the show's cast takes on a much more cynical approach to the current year society, whether it's Peanut making a snide remark about the state of things or Phil celebrating a miscarriage of justice with a high payout. So it's no wonder why one might take comfort in the innocence of their childhood, when these things still existed but were much less frequently perceived during this Saturday morning block of programming. While her name isn't in the show's title, Judy, or Bird Girl, represents the heart of the show. Turner Classic Birdman Robert Osborne introduces a collection of classic Birdman shorts in the vein of the 1960s series, though these are dubbed over videos with the new voice cast. They detail Falcon 7, Philkin 7, informing Harvey of a series of attacks on the sanctity of the USA that Birdman flies to, diffuses, then leaves, with diffusing optional. After being run ragged and having his real life repeatedly interrupted, Harvey announces that he's quitting the superhero game to work a normal job as an attorney, only for Philkin 7 to continue giving him orders. An episode that only differentiates itself by not taking place in a law firm. The animation of Birdman was originally designed to be as cheap as possible to produce, much in the same vein as many other shows of the era. By recycling cells and backgrounds, the animators had to do very little, and although this came at the cost of being unable to create much uniqueness in individual plots, for audiences that wanted a bit of consistency in their consumption, this was not as much of an issue as it may have been in another show. Then, in an ironic twist, the reincarnation of Harvey Birdman began by trying to recycle footage in order to get a rising network animation studio off the ground by making content cheaply. As a result, this episode is similar to the very show it branched off from, despite the aging up of the audience, as well as the sensibilities of viewers becoming less innocent and willing to suspend disbelief for a story. Beyond the Valley of the Dinosaurs Peter Potamus invites Harvey to spend time in his hot tub, but when he activates the jets, the two are sent back in time to the Stone Age. Harvey is captured and set to be eaten due to a prophecy, which also predicts that their pink hippo god will reveal himself soon, which they confuse for Peter. Peter begins to rule until an incident is brought before him, a woman wanting to leave her caveman husband to move into another cave. Harvey recognizes this as a divorce case and volunteers to litigate it which eventually turns into an argument over a woman's rights that results in court-ordered counseling. Meanwhile, Phil travels back as well and, upon finding unspoiled land, declares his intentions to start tours for investors, to eventually set up a mini-mall, among other amenities. But when Phil erupts a sacred volcano, the various ruses all get revealed, and the men return to the present, having irreparably altered the past. This episode toys with various interpretations of code of law throughout mankind's history, poking fun at the different ways in which the concept of right has been interpreted over the years. In the Stone Age, a divorce case is set to be resolved by simply tearing the woman in half, viewed as the typical, or correct, thing to do in the minds of the cave dwellers. But Harvey instead views a modern interpretation as being more correct, that marriage counseling and alimony payments are more civilized, and thus a better solution to the issue. And this comes from a man who has spent many years of his life not doling out justice in front of a jury, but doling it out with his fists. That due process is slow and tedious, and simply blowing up your enemy makes you correct. 
the evolution of morality evolves so much, and yet the show still posits that perhaps in the future, what we view as justice today will seem primitive. The woman trying to divorce her husband starts to make more modernized demands at one point, the kind of thing that was considered new wave at the time this episode aired, and shows that just because we think we're civilized now doesn't insulate us from the passage of time. Evolutionary War K.V. Jr., son of Captain Caveman, reaches the chapter in his school science book on evolution, and being a caveman himself, asks the teacher about it, to which he gets the reply that the school won't be teaching that subject. So Captain Caveman goes to Harvey to represent him in a case against the school, arguing for including evolution in the curriculum. Mentok's defense involves questioning where Birdman falls on the spectrum in the theory, if he's more bird or more man, and this causes Harvey to begin questioning his existence. After a few more testimonies, including calling Magilla the gorilla to the stand to serve as the missing link, Mintok eventually rules in favor of the school teaching whatever it prefers, despite his clear preference for the pro-evolution argument. In the end, Phil busts through the door having been fighting cavemen from the last episode the entire time. One aspect of a show being a product of its time means that all of the things it tries to say are subject to the passage of time. In the early aughts, there was debate over teaching the theory of evolution alongside other ideas, including intelligent design and the flying spaghetti monster. These days, the fervor has long since died down, but the media made during this time is still around, serving as a relic of decades-old politics. This is the kind of thing that causes a work of media to age poorly, more so than any casual sexism or racism or whatever. Because when a work is blatant about its stance on an issue, it reminds audiences of the controversy in the first place, making the work something that takes a stance rather than a reflection of the majority of societal opinions. Of course, this episode is meant to reflect the ruling in the case of Kitzmiller vs. Dover Area School District, where it was found that teaching intelligent design violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, due to not being provable science or separate from religious teachings. At the time of this episode's production, the case hadn't been heard yet, and as such, the ruling in this episode winds up being a rather pessimistic view of the future, a fear of scientific regression due to religious pressure that ended up saying more about the state of mind of the production staff in 2005 more than the episode's narrative itself. Free Magilla The People's Animal Freedom Front liberates Magilla Gorilla from Mr. Peebles' pet shop, only to grow tired of his constant puns and eventually drop him off in the woods. Peebles goes to Harvey for help negotiating with the Front, who are simultaneously protesting Harvey for his ownership of Avenger, made worse when he tries to retrieve his stapler from Avenger's roost and knocks the nest down. While this is going on, Phil Kinsebin takes Peter and his nephews on an employee retreat into the great outdoors, where he mostly throws dynamite at various things while Peter chokes on a plastic ring. In the end, Harvey is able to reunite Magilla when Avenger fetches the gorilla and brings him into court, where he pronounces his affection for Mr. Peoples, dispelling the theories of mistreatment. This episode paints two completely opposite pictures of the type of person to love nature and the outdoors, one who associates survivalism with manliness, while also insulating themselves from any of the lacking comforts that exist within urban society. The other is a love for the creatures within nature, with little regard for the big picture of the environment surrounding them. The People's Animal Freedom Front releases a group of house pets into the wild, the wild in this instance being a suburban area where those animals are likely to die. It's important to consider that, for some species, domestication was an adaptation, that living alongside humans is a symbiotic relationship to everyone's benefit, especially for an animal intelligent enough to form any sort of social bond. And on the other end of the spectrum exists Phil's employee outing, where he extols the virtues of living off the land as a positive trait that any true man should be able to exhibit, all the while doing everything in his power to ignore any of the actual damage he's doing. Like the outdoorsman whose truck has more amenities than a typical apartment, trying to sell the idea that he isn't coddled, Phil ignores the actual natural world in favor of living a theme park version of nature. Return of Bird Girl Race Bannon and Dr. Benton Quest wish to form a civil union, a same-sex marriage, but as it's a constitutional issue, Mintaw can't preside over it, and it must be taken to a higher court, the Justices Leagues. 
Harvey is nervous about arguing in front of them, but with Bird Girl's assistance, the two are able to argue a better case. Though this is complicated by Phil's insistence on taking Bird Girl on more and more dates, as she can't say no without risking revealing her identity. Eventually, the Justices League are called away to deal with a constitutional emergency, so Harvey wins on a technicality. When Phil asks his daughter to marry him, she tries to deflect by claiming Bird Girl is in love with Bird Man, but Phil doesn't buy it and continues on with the marriage anyway. That is, until he sees Judy's aunt, Phyllis, and decides to marry her instead. This episode, in the same vein as Evolutionary War, takes on a current issue with existing arguments as the discussion was in 2005. While same-sex marriages are much more commonly accepted today, it was still considered controversial enough to get an episode focusing on the issue. Much of this controversy came from the fact that it was unfamiliar to a majority of Americans, not just Americans, but the rest of the world. With nearly two decades of hindsight behind us, we can see how popular acceptance of gay marriage spiked following the legalization. Once people got used to the idea, they realized how little merit the fear-mongering surrounding the counter-arguments had. So this was the obstacle in the way of acceptance, just as it continues to block progress today and has blocked progress in the decades before. People once thought interracial marriages were abominable, but only a few years after they became normalized, acceptance rates neared the point that anyone who opposed the idea came across as laughably behind. Unfortunately, it isn't just the barrier of acceptance that needs to be crossed for the country, but legal blockades instead. It's not just about how many typical citizens approve of the idea, but how many justices do. And this becomes an issue when their ideals don't line up. Mindless. Harvey takes the case of Top Cat on request of his acquaintance, Benny, defending the cat for arrest for being a cat, which is code for a litany of miscellaneous crimes. He successfully frees the cat, but as he's been neutered during his confinement, Harvey lets the cat and his associates stay at his place for a time. But they get arrested again for running a gambling ring, and Harvey is caught up in the mess. Meanwhile, Mintok has swapped the minds of Spyro and a dog for a laugh, only to misplace Spyro's mind, forcing him to watch the attorney's body for a while until he can relocate it. But Spyro continuously thwarts Mintok's attempts at dating, so he swaps his mind with the four-year-old and frees Harvey from jail to babysit. In the end, Harvey is let out on the condition that he watched the crew of cats that have taken over. Harvey is, by this point, a side character in his own show, or at least a character with the potential to be one. As the ancillary cast grows in both quantity and quality, his role in the show degrades to that of a straight man, reacting to the antics of the rest of the cast that is simultaneously drowned out by the myriad overlapping in-jokes and callbacks. At a certain point, the number of scenes that actually take place in a courtroom starts to decline to the point that it's a parody of a courtroom drama that doesn't nail the courtroom or the drama. This is an episode that puts more emphasis on Mintok's plot and Top Cat's gang overtaking Harvey's house that calls out a similarity between that event and Harvey's role in the show itself. Like all of the writing is an in-joke and the main character is left out of it. And while it's nice to see that Birdman is not content with simply regurgitating existing media to create something new, it's still a bit retelling that the show has strayed so far from its original premise. It'll take some time to determine whether this reinvention is a completely positive thing, though. Seven and Seven Employee Orientation An orientation film for new employees of Seven and Seven. It begins with the history of Phil Ken Seven, born wealthy, dodging drafts, and putting his left eye in grave danger before suing an office supply manufacturer after losing it to a clip that was able to raise enough to start his business ventures. The video then teaches employees how to circumvent harassment lawsuits and make sure people got that thing you sent them, as well as showing off the various activities employees can enjoy before Phil finally decides the video's gone on long enough and fires whoever is watching it. Phil Kinseben is the archetypal American boss, the Mr. Burns of Harvey Birdman. Born into wealth and living easily since then, he's conflated his bank account with his worth as a person, then used this as a sort of modern divine right. He's rich, therefore he's better than other people, he's better than other people, therefore he's rich. In a fairer system, this would be a fact of life, where wealth is distributed to the hardest workers, but under this society it's instead given to those who already have it, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. The people who have worked the least are the ones who believe the most in the value of hard work. And the rest of the orientation video reflects this. Employees are treated as expendable ATMs to be exploited rather than as human beings. Again, it's moral to do this as long as a rich guy is the one managing it all. 
They're poor, so they deserve to exist in a cycle that keeps them that way. If only they had a trust fund, then they truly understand the value of a day's labor. In the end, the values most upheld by 7 and 7 are the ones reflected in corporate America, enough cultural posturing and HR-mandated equality to appear non-liable for everything else you're doing wrong. Identity Theft Harvey goes to make some photocopies of paperwork for chemical castration, yakky doodle, to get his name changed back. But while he's at the copiers, he annoys Elliot, the deadly duplicator. So Elliot starts making copies of Birdman while the attorney is ruling on a case of stolen identity between Clamhead and Mr. Tinker, as well as later Shaggy. But instead of destroying each other, the Birdmen simply team up. So he starts duplicating Harvey's natural predator, Philkin 7, and the boss begins hunting his employee to thin the herd. Harvey tries to flee until he puts together who it was that was duplicating him, and then hatches a scheme to waste Toner until the duplicator becomes powerless. In the end, the excess copies are simply disposed of and everything goes back to normal. Many early cartoons were rehashed concepts of others, even though both were produced by the same studio. Because of how rapidly cartoons were being churned out, it was inevitable that creators would simply try to iterate on the existing formula with a few slight tweaks. But this had the end result of oversaturating the market with so many extremely similar shows that eventually the bubble burst and Hanna-Barbera went under. Here, the duplication of existing characters is viewed as a threat to Seven and Seven, with Phil trying to call the unnecessary Harveys in order to presumably protect the firm from going under. And yet, isn't it also an old saying that good artists borrow and great ones steal? Just because a work is extremely similar to another one doesn't mean that that work is inherently bad, or even lesser. So many classic television shows borrowed heavily from works that came before, and then iterated on that to become something more timeless. The Flintstones and The Simpsons both began as animated variants on existing sitcoms, but we remember these shows today more than what was being parodied. Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, itself, is a show that straight up rips off many other works of media, so for it to make an episode about cartoon similarities must come with a bit of self-awareness of this trope. Shazan. When Avenger starts talking, Harvey takes him to the vet to get that checked out. Meanwhile, Peanut gets a vase from Phil, who's cleaning out his office, that contains the genie Shazan. Shazan claims he's been trapped in the vase for centuries by a former alias of Mintox. So Mintox is taken to court by Peanut, who's representing the genie, while Harvey is called away to represent Mintox. Mintox reveals that there's a disc that can save his case, but that he doesn't know its location and requests Harvey to obtain it. But when Harvey seems over his head, he tries and fails to break out instead. In the end, Mintok feuds with the other genie for a while before ultimately remembering where the disc was, and he has Avenger read the magic words on it in exchange for a clean urine sample. He's able to reseal Shazan and everything returns to normal after Mintok simply breaks the vase that his rival is trapped inside of. Despite the initial pitch of Harry Birdman being a show that reprises various Hanna-Barbera properties for the 21st century, that quickly diverged from the appeal of the show as the remarkable voice cast and strong humor began to overshadow everything else. Characters who once appeared as bit roles in their original show had developed a life of their own beyond a simple parody of what they used to be, and the fourth season is indicative of this change. And so we have a character like Peanut with vain witches of glory while failing to rule in a case heading off against Mintok, who's become a character with the rich, unseen history in his own right. Harvey Birdman's fourth and final season barely resembles the original in anything other than appearance. Even the original sets feel remarkably detailed for what they were trying to do. A show that began as a cheap means of propping up a new studio that once embraced that limitation no longer has to, and so the show is forced into a strange new territory. Plots have always retained some level of continuity, but this now moves beyond the realm of callbacks and gags as it becomes an aspect of the show's identity itself. Incredible Hippo Adam Ant is charged with having radioactive materials in his home and goes to Harvey to convince the authorities to let him keep his house. He's eventually ordered to stop reducing any waste, as it's thought to be radioactive, a theory tested when Peter Potamus consumes of the pellets and gains radioactive powers, transforming into a monster whenever he gets angry. 
He rampages around the office a few times before Phil begins hunting the creature, to the point that Peter meets Judy, who sympathizes with him as she too is keeping a secret identity. She tries to remedy his anger issues, which works for a time until an explosion occurs, spurred on by Reducto's attempts to enlarge Adam and, who he views as a threat for being too small. When Phil notices Peter rescuing his daughter, he realizes he was wrong to hunt the beast and vows to remedy his ways, foreshadowing his own death out loud in the process. Flanderization is a process by which a character in a long-running TV show starts to slowly lose the nuance to their character as they give way to more and more singular jokes on a single aspect of them. Named after Ned Flanders, who went from a foil to Homer Simpson in the early seasons to a religious zealot stereotype in the later. In Birdman, the flanderization process starts to apply to everybody, double down as those characters start to get caught up in repeated gags. Peter Potamus slowly devolved into a character who cares about little more than whether or not you got that thing he sent you. But in the process of this de-evolution, also started to get more development as well. And much of the rest of the cast has diverged so far from their initial parody premise that this becomes the case th with them too. Peter is so obsessed with that thing that he starts to take on aspects of another fictional character entirely, imitating the acts of the Hulk when this show would have normally made a more oblique reference to that character. It's a case where the steady simplification of a character can turn a throwaway line into a running gag, and then turn that running gag into an entire episode's plot hook, showing just how far Birdman has come as a show, for better and worse. Babysitter Harvey leaves the firm to attend his high school reunion, and as he's leaving, Phil attempts to make him the new CEO, only to be hit by a bus before he can finish the thought. With Harvey gone and Phil dead, Peter Potamus steps in as CEO and allows his friend to step in and convert the law firm to sales. Peanut is left in the hands of Reducto to be babysat while Harvey is out, but Peanut starts to drive the germophobic Reducto mad. Meanwhile, Judy slash Bird Girl is searching for her father slash Phil and tries to convene the Bird team to engage with the search. When they meet at the former location of Seven and Seven, Bird Girl learns from Peter that her father is dead, and Harvey declares himself as the new CEO, disappointed in the way Peter has been running the company. In the end, Peanut gets dropped off by Reducto, who runs away from the kid screaming, only to get hit by a clown car. Stephen Colbert, voice of both Phil and Reducto, left Birdman to focus on his own talk show. While this isn't mentioned outright in the episode, it's still alluded to heavily from Blink and You Miss It sign gags, as well as the man himself appearing in the background of a shot. When a character is written out of a television show with an ambiguous return date, it's often said that they are put on a bus, referenced in an upfront way here as Colbert, sorry, Phil Kinsebin's fate. There's a bit of ironic foreshadowing of real events in this episode regarding the fate of Adult Swim itself. Mike Lazo is often credited as the executive responsible for getting the programming block off the ground. His studio, Ghost Planet Industries, would later become William Street, and created many of the shows that launched the network into relevancy. It was his mind that kept many of the weirder, more experimental programming on the air for so long. And when he left the network in 2019, a few of the less cost-effective shows were also stealthily cancelled as an attempt to improve the market value of the network was pushed. This is why the Venture Bros was quietly dropped after Season 7, something I'm still angry about to this day. Birdnapped Birdman takes over as CEO of 7 and 7, immediately becoming too busy to deal with any other obligations, least of all spend time with his arch-nemesis, X. Hoping to get his attention, X decides it's a good idea to kidnap Bird Girl, who's been much more competent at handling Phil's last few orders of business than Harvey, business such as giving Falcone his old office and firing a few employees. In Bird Girl's absence, the office starts to devolve into chaos, until when Bill, Phil's identical twin brother, shows up and begins to read Phil's will. This announces that Judy is actually meant to be inheriting the firm, and so Harvey has to go back to X's house to rescue her, although she's escaped on her own during that time. Once back where she belongs, Bird Girl realizes that, as his boss, the hero sidekick dynamic no longer works, and Harvey cannot know her secret identity. Harvey has his memory wiped, and wakes up with no office and no recollection of the last few days. Birdman was, at this point, trying to find a direction to head towards without a principal member of its cast. 
This, coupled with the show's ambiguous and ever-changing time slot, meant that it was in a turbulent time and was forcing something to change behind the scenes, lest the show start to fade into obscurity. Its original purpose was to prop up a new studio and give it something to call its own, and it has since done just that. So why then does the show Harvey Birdman still exist? So in the narrative, the same question is asked. What purpose does Harvey himself serve? Bird Girl has followed up on Phil's old role as CEO, and has, since the beginning of the episode, done a much better job at executing his wishes. She's the spiritual, as well as biological, follow-up to the Old Guard, which places Harvey in an awkward middle ground, alongside other relics like X, and frankly anybody else in the cast who still in some way has a small resemblance to their original antics from the days of Hanna-Barbera. The show has evolved to such an extreme that his ecological niche is all but vacant. So where is there to go next? Grodin Ernie Devlin is being sued again, by Bobby again, and due to the harmful nature of the toy that injured the kid, the open and shut nature of the case, Harvey is eager to see it over with quickly. But Ernie doesn't see it that way and insists on mounting a defense by mounting his bike and jumping a ravine he's failed to cross before, a charity spectacle to raise money for the hospital bills. He fails the jump and crashes, though the insurance payout still manages to cover the costs. Meanwhile, X hires the Perfectshi Honest as a life coach, designed to make him more evil than before. After a costly makeover, he sends out letters to all of his enemies, swearing to be more evil in the future. And when Bird Girl gets hers, she immediately starts trying to vaporize him. In the end, he realizes the entire thing was too expensive to be worthwhile and gives up on self-improvement. This episode revisits an earlier plot, adding almost nothing to it but the myriad running gags that have been crammed into each episode's plot since the second season. As a result, there's very little more said than before, and a lot of the room on the pages of the script is dedicated to distractions from the main appeal. That is, unless you consider the ramping up comedic beats to be the initial appeal. And maybe this is a valid perspective to have. Harvey Birdman is a comedy first and foremost, so trying to look too much into it might be a mistake, the last hour and ten minutes of this video being a complete waste of time. Ernie disparages modern children in this episode for being too soft, that their insistence on safety is coddling, and that they'd be better off like him, every bone in his body broken and unable to do anything more than veg out in a semi-comatose state before committing to another terrible idea. He would consider his lifestyle to be a beneficial one, considering the effect all of his crashes have had on his own wealth, but if he hadn't been so lucky as to earn some riches off the stunts, then what purpose would they really serve? Ernie is a person who has dedicated himself wholesale to entertaining others, to the point where there's not much left, physically or otherwise. So perhaps it's better that the kids get the chance to be themselves, instead of having their pain commodified as Devlin's has become. Juror in Court Harvey stalls for time in court by pointing out that one of the jurors has been on the jury before and the case is postponed while Mintock can find a replacement for jury duty. This juror winds up being Harvey himself, but as he cannot sit on the jury in a case he's also arguing, the duplicator makes a copy of him. The copy finds out that whenever the jury deliberates, they simply make fun of Harvey behind closed doors, though he's able to ignore this to argue in favor of himself. But this all comes to a head when the ruling is made and Mintog points out that all the jurors, not just one, have been serving in every single case from the start. So every single defendant is let out of jail, and Harvey is made to redo the last six years of his legal career. Meanwhile, Peter Potamus is called into Judy's office to be reprimanded for his years of multiple entendres, only for him to confuse the disciplinary action for sexual harassment and file an HR complaint. So Judy, as Bird Girl, catches Peter using bad faith vulnerability to get physically close to women in a support group, blackmailing him into dropping the charges. Old shows often reused assets for background shots in order to save time and money, something that comes up regularly in Birdman as a necessity early on and a gag later. But by this point in the series, the creators have very few issues with budget restrictions, and as such, the only reason assets would be reused is to tell a joke. You can only tell the same joke so many times before it gets old, though, and so the jury finally gets called into question as a gag with very little reason to exist. It makes the whole legal procedure look farcical, something reinforced with Harvey not only serving his own case, but rigging it in his favor later. 
Speaking of jokes that get old, Peter Potamus gets called out for his constant sexual harassment throughout the show. It's the type of thing that's also played as a gag, and yet each time a gag is repeated it becomes less humorous, to the point that it's no longer funny to see Peter harassing an intern, just sort of off-putting. Once you've seen it all already, you start to think about why it's there in the first place from a more objective standpoint. We don't think twice about questionable content in media, as long as it's funny, but by this point it's ceased to be that way. The Death of Harvey Harvey is in a slump over his lawyering career being torn away at the end of the previous episode, but the Bird team is able to snap him out of the slump and get him back into the lawyering game, motivating him to try to try all of his old cases once again before Mintock and Lee for vacation. Bird Girl rounds up all the old clients, while Harvey condenses their arguments into a single speech, just in time for Mintock to declare all the rulings are upheld exactly as they previously were. That is, except for his super-secret first client, Nitron, who begins wrecking havoc among the city. The Bird team is able to band together to fight him off, ultimately through convincing Potamus that he didn't tell them about that thing he sent him, and the day is saved, with Harvey being hailed as a hero until Phil comes back to hit him with the bus. Harvey Birdman is over, and what better way to drive that point home than to end Harvey Birdman? His death comes as a practical homage to the rest of the series up to this point, nonsensical and out of nowhere, all being the end of a large building running gag that results in a character death that didn't really matter all that much. You can kill off a character in the final episode as a way to show that you have no interest in reviving the series with him as a part of it. Although this would later turn out not to be the case. Harvey Birdman would make one more appearance in a special, Harvey Birdman Attorney General, as well as the series getting a spiritual follow-up in the form of the spin-off, Bird Girl. But this current incarnation, at the time of the episode's creation, had no reason to exist. The show was meant to be a courtroom procedural to bring a more down-to-earth incarnation of existing Hanna-Barbera properties, and the finale shows that not even that much was sacred. The final obstacle in our characters' journeys being a battle sequence more in line with what we would have gotten out of the original show. Harvey Birdman is dead purely because there was nothing left for him to do while alive. Harvey Birdman, Attorney General Phil Ken Seven wakes up as President-elect of the United States of America, having no memory of how he got the role, and no desire to continue with the responsibilities, as he's keenly aware that he's unstable and liable to blow up the country at a moment's notice, which he does by firing missiles at Washington. He pulls Peter Potamus, now the host of a right-wing talk show, and Harvey Birdman, his retired ghostwriter, out of their retirements in order to have him brainstorm ways to impeach him, all under the leadership of either Bird Girl or Judy Kin Seven, who is the only one concerned about the two having the same identity, and therefore a conflict of interest between how she got her job through potential nepotism. In the end, their investigations into impeachment lead them to Mintock, who was financed by Peter to mind-take the country in order to elect Phil as president so he could sell novelty hats and t-shirts. Eventually, Phil's inaugural impeachment winds up defacing a monument, which is enough to have him charged and removed, so Black Vulcan can undo the missile and save the country. Once everything is put to rest, Harvey is framed for killing his wife, and Peter is executed through some poison sushi, with Phil using the residuals from his presidential book writing business to retire at sea. There's no point in beating around the bush. This special was made in response to the Trump presidency and the ensuing lunacy around the media cycle that encompassed those four plus years. But instead of just taking the much more traveled, easy route and saying, Orange Man bad, as so many other works had been doing up to this point, Birdman takes a slightly more pessimistic approach. In the end, Phil is not impeached for any of the insanity he did while in office, like firing a missile at himself, but for a minor infraction related to his inaugural impeachment ceremony defacing a monument. And then the special ends on a tongue-in-cheek note of the new president simply turning a key to stop a missile in freefall, as though the removal of one man was enough to stop everything that had to have gone wrong to get him there in the first place. So Harvey Birdman was brought back from the dead in order to sell an idea to the public, then gets tasked with undoing the harm he inflicted while out of things. The entire ordeal is orchestrated by Mintock only for him to wind up safely back in his house, ripping off rich people. No matter your thoughts on the president, any president, it's naive to believe that one man or woman can hold that much power over the country that a single vacant position will immediately take things back to the way they were. 
and maybe the nostalgia that brought us back to old Hanna-Barbera properties those years ago was also us trying to recapture some vague feeling of childhood that wasn't abandoned purely because we got older. Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, was a short-lived legal procedural that originally aired on Adult Swim back in 2004. Like many early late-night cartoons, it largely served to fill in gaps in programming cheaply while appealing to teens and young adults who wouldn't otherwise be asleep. While the studio had produced many successful television shows, most notably The Venture Bros, Metalocalypse, and Aqua Teen Hunger Force, it had a myriad of other commercial flops due to their patchwork style of production, where they simply reused what they could in a crude fashion to see what stuck. But it had a role, and then it served that role. And once the function of getting Adult Swim off the ground was served, it no longer had a reason to exist other than a vain attempt at taking pot shots against low-hanging fruit in the media. The show was vague and directionless as of about halfway through the second season, and spent a majority of its later runtime trying to find new footing. And it's admirable that that would happen. Many other shows will ride their initial premise into the ground until it seems pointless to have even started in the first place, but to seek some sort of reinvention instead of getting hung up on the past, ironic considering it was made up of the remnants of old cartoons, shows not just a growth in the network, but a moving on from what it once was. So Harvey Birdman is likely never going to come back purely because there's nothing for him to come back to. The show would very recently receive a spin-off in the form of Bird Girl, reusing very little from the initial show outside of brand recognition. And this is likely the only way that it could have been rebooted. There's no reason to dig up Harvey's corpse beyond this point, but that doesn't mean that his incarnation in our memory serves no purpose. If we can all collectively move on from the past, only then can we make anything meaningful out of it. Thanks for sticking around this long, or if you just skip to the end, that's fine too. I was initially pretty hesitant to cover this show despite wanting to for a while due to the information that I had on it. For one, the extremely fast paced and exponential humor meant that following along with the plot, much less being ahead of the curve, was difficult. All on top of having a surprisingly realistic legal setting, at least realistic enough that I felt the need to do it justice. But it's been about a year since I started making videos regularly for this channel, and as such, I felt it was time to take a crack at it. Made much more appealing from the fact that it's a shorter show than what I typically do. This month has been hectic for me between vacations and moving, so I knew in advance that I wouldn't have much time to work. 40 episodes turned out to be just enough that I could work at my normal pace and still get a video out in time. But it leaves me with a few questions on where to go from here. There are a lot of shows I've seen suggested in my comments in the last several months that I have a keen interest in retrospecting on, and yet, a lot of these are rather short-lived. I'd like to cover something like, say, The Oblongs, but at only a single season it may be a pretty underwhelming project. I think the obvious thing to do is to break from my normal monthly formula and pick a time to do a series of shorter weekly uploads, if only to get some stuff off of the list and onto YouTube. Bird Girl is coming up at some point, too. It's also a shorter show than what I typically cover, though that's because it's ongoing, so the timing is pretty ambiguous on when it will be covered, even though it's still on my to-do list. As always, I'll play it by ear so there's very little in the way of scheduling coming up. Speaking of coming up, I've alluded to the fact that what I cover is mostly stuff that I enjoy that people are commenting about. I read every single comment I get, even if I don't reply to all of them, so if you have something you want to see me cover that I haven't already discussed, or if you just want to tell me hi or that I'm bad at YouTubing, feel free to do so. Is, is he gone?